Hey everyone, and welcome to our new show, The Paleo Post Podcast. On this show, Genevieve and I will review some of the most important, new, and exciting topics relating to paleoanthropology and anthropology. Each week, we'll be going on air to discuss and teach science as it is being done. So get ready because your weekly Paleo Post is incoming. Well, you know, we are... What is this? Week four? <laughs> episode four? I think? I think this is number three. Isn't this number three? I think, I think you're going into you're, you're going into the future. <laughs> oh, I might be. I might be. I'm just enjoying this so much that, you know, it time just flies. And we were just Me talking too. about how much fun we're having doing this. So Oh, absolutely. Also, this is. Yes, I, I believe it's number three. Yes, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but uh, no, I think the big thing is too is that there's a lot of paleo news. Have you noticed that? Like we're actually picking the stories. It's not like we're we're grasping for crumbs here. Like it's so funny. There's so much going on in the paleo world. Absolutely, it's. I mean, you know, it always felt like things are moving fast. I've always called mm -hmm. paleoanthropology one of the fastest fields in science that I know of, at least. I mean, I'm sure yeah. you know astronomy is probably quite on the edge of things, um, but when you're actually making a show about it yep. and you're looking for stories, it's hard now. It It's hard because there's so many that are interesting. I know. We just, as everyone who has listened to the show before should know, we pick three topics yep. that we discuss during our half-hour episodes. So finding just three things to talk about for a whole week's worth of news. It's I mean, actually we hard. To talk about. Yeah, we I know. Are. I already stashed some stuff away for, for that future podcast you were talking about. So, right. you know, I'm guessing there might not be as quite as much news in, like, say, the world of sea slugs. I mean, you know, Marine invertebrates might move a little slower. Haha, <laughs> pardon the pun. <laughs> oh, boy. That's what we're I, here for, everyone. Fine. I know, right? I feel like you need the ba da da ch. Don't forget the bad jokes. Um, you know what? Getting a sound blow <laughs> would not be the worst thing in the world. <laughs> So it might annoy some people, but it wouldn't be the worst thing. <laughs> but okay, you know what? Go. We're gonna start. Go about. ahead. Exactly. We're talking so about much. how much we have to talk about. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna start out today about talking about fifty-seven thousand to about possibly farther ranges of around seventy thousand mm -hmm. year old engravings found in the Loire Valley, France, um, and. The thing about these engravings, which we've clearly identified as intentionally made markers, engravings on a rock surface, mm -hmm. is that during this period in France, it's not just Homo sapiens walking around. We are contemporary with Neanderthals. This is the later part of their range. They're getting close to their extinction in a few ten more a few more, you know. Tens of thousands of years. There we go. There we go. Um, so there, there's a lot going on here. So, you know, you are a rock art expert, specifically during the Ice Age, which I think this kind of falls under a bit. Oh, solidly. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I first saw this and I thought, you know, well, didn't we see that Neanderthal art is older than this? Why are they calling this the oldest engravings that have mm -hmm. been found, done by Neanderthals? What's what's the difference here? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so the difference is is that you're talking about so you're talking about the three sites in Spain where they did uranium series dating, and the dates came back as sixty five thousand was when these different pigments were covered up, but this is paint pigment. So the distinction, <clears throat> pardon me, is in France, they're talking about engravings. And so before this, the oldest engraving they had was 39,000 at Gorham's Cave in Gibraltar. And so wow. this is fairly significantly older in the engraved side of the street. But if we're talking about actual oldest 
art as, a, as an umbrella term, then the Spanish caves would still hold the title technically. Um, and I mean, much love to my Spanish and French colleagues, but there's also a bit of rivalry between the two countries. So I think that they do kind of like it when somebody has the oldest of title. Um, so I, I'm giggling a little bit since I'm Canadian, so I'm on the outside of that that little that that, that friendly rivalry. Um, but uh, so they're. It is definitely the oldest engravings known at the moment. Now, engravings, so this is interesting because this was not made with a tool. These were made by using their fingers. So this is La Roche Cotard cave. And um, super interesting cave. It was actually first found in 1846. So, and, and so many of these caves exactly found like this. They were constructing a railway. And they blasted into the rock, and lo and behold, they found there was a cave in there. And so this is where, there's a lot of caves that have been found that way. Um, and, and this also speaks to, to me, to how many other caves are out there where the entrances got sealed, which is what happened with La Roche Cotard, is that over time, sediment built up during the Ice Age, and the entrance was actually sealed off. It became a full-blown time capsule. And this is where the 57,000-year-old dates come from, is that's when the cave was sealed. Oh. Yes. So this is why they feel fairly certain that there wouldn't there wasn't any pesky homo sapiens <laughs> trotting in there at a slightly later date when they arrived um and and making these marks. Um because to the again, also slightly contested dates and I think we all know things are often older than we think they are and dating's been a bit of a problem in the past, but roughly right now I would say humans, Homo sapien, our direct ancestors arrived in Europe around 45 to 50,000 years ago, depending on where you're talking. So at 57,000 sealed, at this point, there's no evidence for Homo sapien being there. So this is a pretty good case of, it pretty much must have been Neanderthals. Um, and I think they said, as you said, the range was 57 to 75,000. And again, a that's... There. A little yeah. off there. Yeah, so yeah, so a little bit, little bit different than when Homo sapiens had quite arrived there um, at the moment. But really great when it comes to, you know, this ongoing debate about Neanderthal art. I mean, you know where I stand on it. I mean, I basically wear the Team Neanderthal t-shirt, which I feel like I need to make one. Um, but, uh, you know, so I think the one other thing I wanted to point out with La Roche Cotard is there was already tools. They already knew there was stuff going on there. You know, um, I think there was some animal bones as well. So they've known about the site for a while. They even had seen these before. So what these are is they weren't engraving with a tool. They were doing finger flutings or meanders. So they were taking their fingers and the wall of the cave in there was this soft material called tufo, which is like a chalky clay-like kind of surface. And it's really fun to run your fingers through. It's soft and squishy. And so it would have been quite easy for them to make these marks. And so they were not only creating these long meandering shapes, they were also poking fingers into the wall. So this is a dots and lines panel. Wow. So of course I'm like, and once again, geometric signs. There we go. <laughs> 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 so, um, but, uh, but so yeah, so it's lines and dots and it was made by poking fingers into the wall by running the fingers through the wall, but they did some interesting tests in there too, because there's also cave bear scratches and other things. So they had to kind of differentiate between like different things. There's also more modern tool marks made with metal tools. So they had to do 3D scanning. They did this really detailed study to figure out which were the old finger-made marks, which were modern metal marks, which were cave bear claw marks, and then to sort of ascertain, okay, these were made on purpose, and these are definitely from, these are, these are human, human or human cousin-made marks as opposed to made by animals or modern humans. And that's just, you know... Again, Team Neanderthal all the way. Right? I know. Uh, I mean, you know, there was that one story where they had found arrowheads in somewhere in France that was 55,000 years. Yes! The oldest that I now recall, now that I'm thinking straight. Yeah. Uh, modern humans being in Europe. So even then, we still have a solid case that it was only Neanderthals. Yeah present to make these engravings now one question before we move on to our yeah. next 
topic was you mentioned Gorham's Cave. Yes. Was that engraving the now famous hashtag or is that something Correct. else? That... Yeah, no, that's the hashtag, the, the very famous hashtag. So, um, yeah, and, and so that one's, so once again, no linear marks, geometric signs, ha <laughs> um, But it, again, in a context where there's no evidence of Homo sapien having been down around Gorham's Cave around then, Homo sapiens did go into that cave more like around 15,000 years ago in Gibraltar, but they were not there around 39,000. At that point, it, the only evidence is for Neanderthals. And we're saying this for the view, for the listener's sake. Um, we're looking at tool types, for instance. So ancient humans and ancient Neanderthals made slightly different types of tools. And so you can kind of ID them based on the tool type. Um, now, what I'm really curious about is if they were poking their fingers into the walls at La Roche-Catal, I wonder if it might be possible. Like, I wonder if there's any remnants of genetic material oh you know no, I'm, I'm intrigued i'm always in you know me i'm like the paleogenetic i've always got my little paleogenetics hat on but this is where we're going in the field i mean can you imagine you know i i feel like we could do a whole podcast on this but just quickly let's just throw out there if yeah. there was a site such as that where there was genetic material gained mm -hmm. from the paint yeah. that is on the wall what would that mean if um, it was turned out to be neanderthal well i mean i think that's the mic drop isn't it i think so <laughs> i think that's, do you think there would that's, still be yeah. um do you think there would still be an argument um well i mean i think the the, the trick is here and again i don't want to get too far into our, the weeds right, right, right now right. um yeah, but exactly. working on an upcoming project where we are going to be doing some paleogenetic attempted sampling and i'm so excited about it so what we're doing is we're using two confirming labs it's called so the idea being is that you don't just use one lab you use two labs you split the sample up so in order for it to pass the test um you need both labs to find the same thing and that's really important. And that's how you build a very solid argument, too, because it's very hard to argue that two top tier, you know, genetic sequencing labs on opposite sides of the world came up with the same results in error. Right. Yeah. Right. So that, that's kind of so that's one of the keys here is, is that, you know, really, really setting up the framework for the study so that so that it's hard to argue with the results if we get any. Right. There we go. Yeah. yeah. So there you okay, but now okay. Psh, gonna stop. We'll stay here for no, hours. No. Speaking of genetics, though, that segue. Oh my gosh, we're so I good. Know. It was by accident. See? See? <laughs> okay, go. You think it was by accident? You think it was? By <gasps> oh, accident. you Seth, Ooh. Okay, yeah, she's using know. that big Homo sapien brain. Okay, go no, for it. No, Tell no, us right? about that next story. <laughs> so, <laughs> the next story that we're going to be talking about, we are going to fast forward. Yeah. We're going to fast forward from, like we were talking about, 57,000 years ago, all the way to 6,500 years ago. So, as... Like whiplash, right? Like, time... Whiplash. Whiplash. Exactly. whiplash. Okay. Um, many of you might recognize, instead of hearing 6,500 years ago, it would be 6,500 BC for some of our older folks who might have been in school, I don't know, back during... In, back the in the BC age. days... <laughs> yeah, back in the BC days. Uh, that's how I was raised. But. You know, my son always asks me, basically teases me about dinosaurs and stuff. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. go on. Yeah, so <laughs> we are staying in France, though. So that's yes. interesting. Uh, a lot of paleoanthropology happens in France, yeah. as we learn as the show goes on. So we're going to be looking at a graveyard. Or, yes, we're talking about you know modern humans. I can say a graveyard. Yeah, yeah. Um, not used to that that's weird I, I know isn't it like to actually be like we're not even we're not even concerned whether it's intentional we're like it's intentional they buried right. their dead in a spot now is this neolithic or is this yeah. like bronze it is, age is it, considered neolithic okay it's considered neolithic yes okay. um the whole period that it existed was seven four thousand to seven thousand years ago okay so it's the neolithic and there were Oh, I'm going to butcher this name here, but we're going to try our best. There were dozens of burials at this site called... No, I'm not even going to try. I, I don't have it up. Hold on. We can get up uh, the name for you here right now. Okay, you carry on. <laughs> we'll get the name. 
we'll get it. But let me, I'll uh, continue with the story while yeah. Jen gets that. So there were 120 individuals found in this grave that looked different than the other ones. It looked clearly that something was a little off. Maybe they were related. They didn't know. They thought maybe some people could be related, but nothing spectacular. It's traditional of Neolithic communities. You'll have families that are together that are buried together. But when they did genome testing at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany, 90 oh, to the Max Planck, <laughs> right? 94 out of the 128 individuals recovered were actually related to one another. That's bonkers. Right? It's absolutely yeah. mind blowing. Yeah. So they've actually been able to create an entire family tree. So that is, one, it is the largest prehistoric family tree we've had that we've been able to actually map people. But it yeah. spans seven generations. So cool. Which, for any family tree, even early modern times, and my family tree doesn't go back that far, uh, you know, seven generations is a long span of humans when we only yeah. live, you know, 100 years around there max. So, this story really, it's not, of course, specifically paleoanthropology, but it really shows a lot of the work that paleoanthropologists do when it comes to genetics, getting genome testing, mm -hmm. the archaeology involved. Yeah. And it's just a super interesting story because it's about humans and something yeah. we haven't seen before. Well, and also, yeah, for me, I think, so the name of the site, it's um, Gurgi Les Noisat. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll let like you have that one. I know. I feel like we need to link this because, I mean, yeah, the the family tree is gorgeous. Like, I mean, it's phenomenal. Right. And the reason why I thought, I mean, the reason why I thought it was a good idea when you suggested, like, this that we do this story was that, um, I mean, it's, it's Neolithic, but it's so close to the Paleolithic that they're having to use a lot of the same techniques, right? Like, it's basically the same techniques. So... Any and every time, so this is like, instead of being paleogenetics, this is neogenetics. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's close enough, and, and it's more that they're getting better and better at the protocols, which is fascinating in its own right, right to see how much better works you're getting. And the more practice we have, the better we're getting with the methods. Because to rebuild ancient DNA, whether it's 7,000 years old, 10,000, 50,000, you know, it's fragmented. And, and it requires, it's, it's just fascinating how they rebuild. It's like this crazy puzzle. It's really neat um, about how they rebuild the little pieces of fragments. And, and you're, they're actually using a form of machine learning that they were using even before the really fancy AI. So now I'm really curious to see what these new versions of AI might be able to contribute to helping to rebuild. And then what they use is they have these reference libraries they've built and they're comparing to reference libraries is basically what they're doing. So it's really cool that way too. Um, the other thing I thought that was so neat was I think, didn't it go back to like one gentleman in particular? It did. It was did. like the great, 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 great grandfather yeah. of, of all those people, right? The, yeah, the related they ones? They them all to one uh, male that they all seem to be related to. So yeah. cool. Yeah, and then also, didn't they say that the males were all more closely related and the females were the ones who'd come from afar? And so maybe the unrelated ones, certainly in the earlier generations, I think they were saying, so that think about the clues you can get from that, right? Like, so now we know that it's what's called patrilocal. So what that means is that the women moved between the groups and the men stayed in their home group, basically. So we know that now. Whereas there's other locations where it's matrilocal, so it's actually the men who move between the right? So like so really neat cultural information we're gathering from it. Um and then the other thing that jumped out at me about the story was just that you know these Y chromosomes, I would be fascinated. I haven't had a chance to look, but I'm so intrigued. I'd love to know how far back does that Y chromosome, like, where, what's the history? And now I want to go grab, because I know my, I've got my genetic profile, of course. Um, so now I'm like, am I related? I want to go look. Um, so I think it's, it's really fun every time we start building out the family tree. We just learn more about the variation and, and sort of the history. And, um, you know, we've got other Y, y chromosome lines. I've 
wonder if there's modern people alive today who are descendants. Like, that's what's so fun to me. Is that, that connection, right? You never know. Yep, there it, probably it, is, right? You well, you know, I'd say the Iceman had a modern relative. That was I, really cool. I didn't. I do know that, yeah. Isn't that so fun? So, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that's where, again, it's, it's genetic material is what connects us to our ancestors, like, very directly. And so there's something really beautiful about when we when we learn more about another genome, right? So it was very exciting. So there you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> One, I mean, it, it really, because, you know, it just, it, like you mentioned, that real connection to your ancestors and yep. being who you are. I mean, there's a lot of ways people find that. And, yep. you know, that soccer mom who does genealogy on Saturdays, you know, that might be her way of doing it. And there's nothing wrong yep. with that. No, it's so cool that we've gotten to the point that she can. Yes, I, I mean, honestly, I mean, I think that's one of the things about you know what we do with paleoanthropology, and this is that these are our ancestors, and yeah. I'm using "our" with almost a capital O, like "O U R." These are mm -hmm. our ancestors. So it's like when you're when you go back far enough, like we all descend from the same people. So I think part of what resonates so much with people about the Paleolithic is that this is our collective heritage, right? This is like the heritage of humanity. So, I mean, it's, it's any time you can learn just a little bit about them, it, it feels really fun. Absolutely. And, you know, I think talking about heritage, that's a perfect segue. Oh my but, gosh, we uh, did it again! <laughs> no, we did. We did. <laughs> We're natural, Seth. Absolute naturals. It's like we, it's like we do this a lot. It's like we planned it, but we didn't. But it's amazing. Like I didn't. Maybe you did. I wasn't that organized. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, this is perfect. Okay, I'll introduce this one because I brought this story in, sort of um, in. But heritage is perfect. It's an ongoing story. So this is more like a stay tuned for more. But I just um, thought it was really interesting, and a feature about the site came out in the. I think it was the. Sydney Morning Herald, I believe it was. So it's like an Australian paper, and these are colleagues um, in from the field from Australia. So Peter Vath and Fiona Hook were the folks that I learned about this through. And um, it's just yeah, so it's in progress. Stay tuned. We don't have like definitive answers, but they've been doing some really amazing work at this site in. So this is in Northwest Australia in the Pilbara region. And the name of the cave is the Yura Cave. And they've got dates there of 50,000-ish years old, possibly even older. Um, but for now, they're sitting around 50,000, which is amazing, considering we're talking about Australia. And um, so, speaking of ancient heritage, at the moment, this is now one of the oldest like sort of hard dated sites in Australia. And if you think about when people would have had to leave Africa, <laughs> to already be in Northwest Australia by at least 50,000. Um, I mean, I think at this point, the thought's more, maybe more like 60, 65,000 is probably when the first folks crossed over. Okay. Um, but still, I mean, this is that, this is now starting to back that up, right? And so Yura Cave is not only just really interesting, again, from a world heritage point of view, filling in the you know the blank spots on the map which is amazing trying to understand that that ancient story of migration around the world um but there's some really cool features as well so this is in the uh, yinghawanga traditional territory and this is the first ever traditional owner-led excavation oh so my colleagues are working with the actual traditional owners of the cave which are which are these folks from the Young Hawanka? Um, and I'm sure they think they do use the word tribe down there. And so this this is their site. They've known about this site. Um, I mean, obviously since time immemorial, and um, they still used to visit it. It was the, it's what they call a drop in center. So it's not that people lived there. It was more a spot where people would um, hang out short term while collecting resources in the vicinity um but the thing that makes this cave so interesting as well is that it's in the middle of a mine basically <laughs> yes so did you hear about what happened down the road from there a couple of years ago I, uh you were mentioning it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
So it's, um, it's as you could, as the listeners point, I'm a pretty happy person. This was very upsetting and actually made me angry, which takes a lot um, when I heard this, because I mean, this is, again, it's, it's a, it's the kind of thing that really needs to stop. And what this was is that nearby there were two caves, I believe, and this is in an area called the Jukan Gorge. Those caves have 46,000-year-old dates. 46,000! And the traditional people in that territory still use those caves for ceremonial purposes at certain times of the year. Unfortunately, also on mining property. So the big problem here is that these were all on land owned by Rio Tinto. And um, same problem with Yura Cave. And those caves got blown up. Wow. Yes. Like, I, I don't even know. What, you know what I mean? Like, there's no... There's no way to soften that. They got blown up. And it that was... I, it, the, there's nothing good to say except that maybe this will be a turning point with how these sites are treated in that part of the world. Because that upset a lot of people. I mean, 46, right? right? As it should. I know. And I think sometimes it can be so hard because... There's cultural heritage sites around the world that are being threatened, right? But I think sometimes it can be really hard for the traditional owners to get the attention of the public and to get people's awareness up and, and to get people to understand why it matters. But I think 46,000 years of occupation was hard to ignore. Like, that's a really, you know, world heritage of all of us. Like, the whole world turned around and kind of glared at that when that happened, right? And so yeah. this initiative comes out of that so if there's any silver lining out of that horrible thing it's that suddenly the mining company has realized that they really do need to be accountable or like this is not this is not something that can continue and so they actually funded this with yes. a hands off yes um so i guess in previous times they haven't really allowed archaeologists to go in and do extensive work in these particular caves and this again happens all around the world so this isn't just um we might be mad at rio tinto but it's not just them um <laughs> right like like it, this happens all over the world the, the problem is, is have you ever heard the term salvage archaeology no okay so salvage archaeology basically and again it happens all over the world which is almost that you know i'll give the example in canada so in canada it would be something like they want to put a road in and they find a burial burial site or burial grounds or something. Right. And um, when that happens, they have to stop right. building the road and they have to bring people in to assess it. But everything's always like under the gun, right? Because progress is being held up by these rather inconvenient, I'm using air quotes, everybody, inconveniently located, whatever the site is, right? And so there's always huge pressure on these archaeologists to come in, and it's called salvage archaeology, because they salvage what they can, basically, and then they're told to get out of the way so they can finish. So it's basically like a very superficial assessment. Yeah, yeah, okay, there's tools. Yeah, yeah, there's this. Okay, now we're going to knock our way through it and keep going. And that's sort of traditionally all around the world, how it's almost like, well, we checked the box, but yeah. they didn't allow deep, real excavations to take place because it takes time, and then they can't do their work while these things are happening. So this was, where, again, where they'd done a bit of work at the cave before, and even just in the first, I think it was like the first 5, 10 centimeters, so really just a few inches right at the top layer, they were already finding stuff that went back, I think, 23,000 years, which is where they were like, what would happen if we dug down farther? And right. so this, yeah, isn't that cool? And, and so, look, they were already at 50,000, and I mean, they're not necessarily done. I didn't get the sense they were down to bedrock. So this is the first cave in that area that they've actually allowed a real comprehensive excavation to take place as opposed to keeping it to do an assessment and then get back out so that's also i think really exciting when it comes to you know look what they start to find and certainly the the first people in that area and my archaeological colleagues who are partnering with them have all agreed that i mean there's probably an there's probably rather a large number of other year caves in that vicinity you know you, so yeah yeah i mean as we we're talking about people have been inhabiting Australia, especially Northern Australia yep. for 60 plus thousand years. Yep. Uh, it, it, I don't think it's not, I don't think it's agreed upon now, but prior 
to the last decade or so, wasn't it thought that Australia might have been the first out of Africa migration for modern humans? Oh, that's a really good question. Okay, so what we know now, see, we're back to genetics again. Can you tell? We have a slight, we have a slight bias towards this. Um, okay, so I, this comes not just for me because I would ex- I would describe myself as a non expert with good working knowledge of paleogenetics. Um, cause I'm not like the Max Planck Labs or my colleagues who do all this stuff. Um, but I'm pretty familiar with it. So what I've understood from good sources within who specialize in this is that basically every, almost everyone alive today descends from about 10,000 individuals who were the last big wave out. Everybody, yes, there were earlier waves that left. They didn't make it they did what's called going locally extinct. So for instance, like there, we have 120,000 year old burials um, up in Israel, for instance, in sites called school and Kafse, but those, those people didn't make it. They're not our direct ancestors. They died out locally. They didn't contribute to our genetic pool. So what we've understood now is that the first folks in Australia are like, we're probably the first wave out of, of something that lasted probably like a, it could even be like a 5,000 year, like keep in mind that it's not like they're the, the group got together. Cause this is all from one group in East Africa. It's absolutely mind blowing to think like, imagine if, if that group hadn't made it, like it's fascinating to think that we, we have yeah. all of us have those people to think, but you know, it's not like they, they got together and called a meeting one day and we're like, right, we're off to Australia. Here's the map. <laughs> Get your hiking boots on and your trail mix. Let's go. Um, you know, so this was more like these little groups were probably crossing the Red Sea, which was more of a swampy, shallow sea at that point, going across through the Middle East appears to be the route through the Arabian Peninsula and then out and around the old world and different groups went in different directions. Um, so one of the first groups out and or one of the most adventurous groups so maybe one of the ones that was really pushing because other ones might have been like you know they were you know by the seaside in yemen and they were like it's a nice view maybe we'll just stop here for a bit so again different people probably did different things and as always hunter gatherers prefer to stay you know just for a resource resource point of view they need smaller groups and so the first people to australia would have been groups that kept going but without an agenda necessarily. Like they were probably following coastlines and resources. Right. Right. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense. Yeah. But there are definitely our close relatives too. Oh well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, we did it. I know we can either stop here or we can keep going for another hour. Exactly. <laughs> so let's stop. Uh, we got to keep this short for people. Exactly. <laughs> you know, they always say for us to just keep talking, but honestly guys, yeah, we like to keep it so we have enough content to talk every week. Right, and I know we're not running out. I already have stories building up for next week coming. I know, about. so exactly. Yeah. so we're gonna call it here. Woo-hoo! We did it's it. Been, I know it's been me, Seth. Yep, and, and it's been me, Genevieve. <laughs> you, Genevieve, <laughs> and we are the Paleo Post podcast i know it's like the triple p it's kind of fun i feel like we need a cool logo i know since i like symbols and all we should work on that work on that (laughs) um this is now on podbean as well as it is on itunes podcasts or apple podcasts whatever they call it now and as far as podbean goes as far as i understand it it's an rss feed that you can use with any uh podcast players so if you use spotify or audible or some anything other, and everything. Yeah. Anything and everything. You can just copy that RSS feed link and paste it in, and you'll be automatically subscribed, and the new episodes will load into your app whenever they come out. Oh, cool. Seriously? Yeah. Oh my gosh. All this modern technology, it's amazing. I spent too much time in caves. I didn't know that's how it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm such a, see we need like bad da, 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 <laughs> i'm not even trying come back next week folks for more of the same right <laughs> all right guys we will talk to you next week that was awesome bye bye